My first guest tonight is Dr Jay Bhattacharya, joining me from the States to discuss a new documentary by Leighton Woodhouse and Michael Schellenberger called The Censorship Files, which asks how much we would pay for our own freedom. Let's take a look at the film. Moments of real terror at what's going on and the potential for tyranny. To see it happening is... It's shocking. If the Supreme Court says that the government can coerce, pressure, work with tech companies to censor speech, I don't think that the First Amendment has any meaning anymore. It's especially when you have a crisis situation that you need the First Amendment. The so-called counter-disinformation units have basically become counter-dissent units. The powers of, of the state in Silicon Valley are merging. Hopefully, uh, by the wonders of technology, Dr. Bhattacharya joins me now. Are you there, Dr. Bhattacharya? I am, Neil. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's good, good to see you. Good to hear your voice as well. You, you are one of the authors of the, of the document that's gone down in legend now as the Great Barrington Declaration, and it advocated, t well, targeted protection of those vulnerable to COVID uh, rather than the rest of the measures. W when you published it, way back when, how did you expect it to be received? I expected there to be an honest discussion among public health professionals about how better how to better protect vulnerable older people. I expected there to be an open schools. I expected there to be an, an uh, a acknowledgement that what we had been doing, the lockdowns had been tremendously damaging. Instead, Neil, what we got was uh, censorship, smearing, suppression. It was really uh, an, an absolute... Uh, a disgusting attack, a propaganda attack on the Great Barrington Declaration and its authors. And after all, I think I'm right in saying it ended up with tens of thousands, not just thousands, but tens of thousands of names associated with it. Nobel laureates, all sorts of eminent people had put their names to it. And as you say, this, this campaign of, of ridiculing and silencing and the rest, but you are fighting back. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're, you're finally pushing back Yes, uh, tens of thousands of doctors signed it. Uh, the the attack on it, I think, it really in reality was a, because tens of thousands of doctors, including Nobel Prize winners, signed it. We had shattered the illusion that there was a consensus in favor of lockdowns. Uh, the what happened afterwards was essentially a campaign to to, to smear us and make sure the public never heard of us. Uh, the head of the National Institute of Health wrote an email to Tony Fauci calling us fringe figures and calling for a devastating takedown of us. Um, what we found uh, later on, uh, a, a year, about a year later, I was contacted by the Missouri and Louisiana Attorney General's office. They had uh, had the idea that the Biden administration was coordinating some of the censorship efforts. Uh, in this lawsuit against the Biden administration, this Missouri versus Biden case, we uh, had the right to uh, read the government emails to social media companies uh, and to depose people like Tony Fauci. And what we found was that the idea that we were being censored was not a conspiracy theory, but was actually happening in fact. Uh, what, what the government essentially was saying, it was telling the social media companies that if you don't censor these people and these ideas, you know, uh, ideas that were true, things like the vaccine doesn't stop transmission, that it has some side effects, that the lockdowns are harmful, all of these like basic facts, scientific facts, the government found inconvenient. And so they, what they did was they said to the social media companies, if you don't censor these people and these ideas, we are going to, to go after you with regulatory action. They threatened the, the, the business of the social media companies. Um, it absolutely was a violation of our free speech rights. I was put on a blacklist at Twitter the day I joined in August 2021, uh, simply for the crime of posting the great, a link to the Great Barrington Declaration. Dr. Bhattacharya, bear with me while I, I bring in my, my guest in the studio. Uh, Tom, that is quite some testimony, isn't it? It's absolutely outrageous that there are eminent scientists and academics that have been put on uh, blacklists and uh, that should never happen. But we've seen, haven't we, in terms of our own government here with the Cabinet Office trawling Twitter accounts, just in general looking for anyone that uh, doesn't go along with, if you like, the, uh, the government's narrative, not just on the vaccines but on a whole range of issues. And they've been deplatformed from conferences where government ministers and others are appearing. So, so much for fr uh, free speech. Um, and, you know, I think you will guess there. Indeed, I mean, Dr. Bhattacharya, indeed, so much for free speech. What, what, 
was your worldview, has your worldview been changed by what you saw and what you experienced over the last few years? I mean, I'm a, I'm a naturalized U.S. citizen. I had had the idea of the United States as uh, the civic religion of the United States is free speech. I've been absolutely stunned. And um, Neil, it's not simply just that it, it happened in the past. Uh, I've, when I've testified in front of Congress, what I've found is that uh, m major elements of, of, of the Democratic Party view this as a social good to keep the censorship apparatus in place. I, I mean, I, I can understand that my opinions about the pandemic were controversial. But science often involves that kind of controversy. And certainly when you're talking about some of the most consequential decisions that governments have ever made in my lifetime regarding uh, public health policy, we needed a debate. We needed an open discussion. The government did the, the public a disservice by not allowing that debate. I mean, I, I believe very firmly that the science was on my side during the pandemic, that, that sc closing schools was damaging and didn't do much for protecting anybody, that we should have protected vulnerable older people better. I think that we would have won that debate. But I think that that is the fundamental reason why the censorship effort was needed was because the government would have lost that debate had it been allowed to take place in open in open air. Instead, they needed to use these underhanded methods to make sure that people didn't hear about me, or if they did, they would hear about uh, me or Sinatra Gupta or Martin Kuldorf or other or others of the tens of thousands of people scientists who signed the Great Branch Declaration as if we were fringe figures rather than you know eminent scientists. Why do you think it happened when it did? You know, I mean, f f since time immemorial, you know, emergencies have, have, have befallen societies and, and governments have acted and so on and so on. And, and, and scientists and other experts and people from many fields have, have offered their opinion. Why in response to this particular event... Did the suddenly the glove the the mask came off, and we, we were confronted with what was perhaps the reality of government all along? I mean, I think a, a relatively small group of scientists somehow convinced the public, and particularly the, the the politicians, that if they weren't adhered to, listened to, that the public would be would be uh, would be harmed, that the millions of people would die, uh, and I think as a, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, the problem was that with this group of scientists did not actually have a consensus behind them. But uh, now, once politicians became convinced that these scientists were 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 on to something, that if that you had to impose a, these extraordinary measures, well, how do you keep a lockdown in place? How do you keep a, a, you know a, a, a family from sending their kids to school? How do you keep uh, to tell people that they uh, they should it's good for society that they lose their jobs or that they stay isolated or they can't visit their their mother uh, in in a nursing home or or, or your father while he's dying? Uh, you that you can't hold a funeral. The only way you do that is by convincing them that every scientist agrees that it's there's a a, a, a consensus behind this and really is for the social good. And so they needed the censorship apparatus to destroy the, possi the, the possibility for the public to learn that there were scientists, eminent scientists, that disagreed with those relatively small group of scientists that controlled government policy. Astonishing testimony, Dr. Bhattacharya. I've run out of time, I'm afraid, but I hope we'll be able to pick up and continue with this conversation at another opportunity. Thank you very much so far this evening. Another break then, after which I'll be joined by the director and creator of The Censorship Files, Michael Schellenberger. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live. We were just discussing the film The Censorship Files and my next guest is the man who wrote, directed and produced the documentary along with Leighton Woodhouse, Michael Schellenberger, a Twitter Files journalist and founder of Public, joins me to discuss the international censorship industrial complex. Good evening, Michael. Thank you for joining us. It's good to finally be able to meet with you and talk with you. Oh, Long me too. The, the feeling's mutual. Now, uh, Michael, the, the First Amendment to the American Constitution, uh, the amendment about free speech, is it just words on a piece of paper? Or does it still mean something? Oh, well, that is the, maybe the most important question that should be asked right now. You know, our founding fathers, uh, the people that created the United States of America, they wanted to do things differently than it had been done in Europe. 
We did not want the king to decide what we would be allowed to say or not say. We wanted speech to come before government in a certain way. And that's why I became the first amendment of the Constitution. But the people that created the United States of America, they knew that the First Amendment only worked so long as the American people really believed in it. And that's one of the things that's been challenged. We saw the num- the percentage of Democrats who want the government to be involved in censoring false information online rise from 40% to 70% between 2018 and 2023. So it's very scary. Now, now the switch, of course, is that many conservatives, because they've been censored, are now more supportive of free speech. So we're in a very strange situation, which you've talked a lot about, but I think the potential here is for free speech to have support uh, from the political right in the United States and to gain support from a minority of people on the left who still believe in free speech, you might say classical liberal types like myself. And so, um, but yeah, that's the test. And that's obviously why we want the documentary. There's a big Supreme Court case in the United States that's being heard. We testify in front of Congress. There's all of our journalism. But ultimately, it's just as you said, that people of the United States must believe in free speech for us to have free speech protections. Now, you talk in the trailer, and I played the trailer earlier in the show, um, you talk about moments of real terror in the face of the tyranny you see being assembled. And that's strong language. I feel your pain. Um, talk me down off the roof, if you will. <laughs> Give me reasons to, you know, to have some kind of confidence of, of being able to push this terror away. Well, I think the strongest reason to have hope is that we can see so many people around the world want to come to live in Britain. They want to come to live in the United States. They want to come to live in free countries. And people would rather have freedom than not freedom. Now, I think there's some percentage of people on the left in the United States and in other Western countries, including Britain and Europe, that were temporarily willing to sacrifice some of those freedoms in the case of a pandemic. That's often the instinct that people have during other crises. We think it's the wrong instinct that in a crisis you need free speech to be able to understand what to do. And that's the conversation you just had with with, uh, Stanford professor Jay Bhattacharya, that we, we need free speech in order to solve crises. But the elites use fear to get people to give up these fundamental freedoms. I think we have to slow people down a bit. Uh, There's this distinction that the famous psychologist Daniel Kahneman talks about between fast thinking and slow thinking. When people think about it, they would rather have freedom. They would rather have free speech, free expression. They would rather be able to speak their mind. That's why so many people are trying to come to the United States and to get into Europe from countries that do not respect those fundamental freedoms. And I think that ultimately is what we have to remind people of. We have to remind people that this is an existential question, an existential moment for liberal democratic civilizations in the West, and that it starts with a defense of free speech. Now, now you tweeted recently this week, I think, um, you said, today we have ripped back the veil of the censorship industrial complex and are on the cusp of defunding and dismantling it. Now, that, that's bold and, and heartening language. Uh, are, you, are you as confident as that, that we can do enough to save our traditional freedom of speech? I do. I actually feel more optimistic uh, than I have in the year since we've discovered that military intelligence and other security organizations in the United States and other Five Eyes nations, including Britain, uh, first and foremost in Britain because of our special relationship. um, I feel much more optimistic now than I did when we first discovered this. I think that the high point of the censorship industrial complex's power was in April of 2022, when the U.S. Department of Homeland Security announced a disinformation governance board, which was rightly criticized as Orwellian, both in name and in purpose. And there was an enormous backlash by the public against that. The Twitter files emerged eight months later. And we're now a year since that point. And I think that... uh, I think that we see people advocating censorship on the defensive. I just tweeted earlier this morning that one of the people that testified, uh, the lead witness for the Democrats who testified on Thursday, 
denied in her testimony that she had called government censorship a conspiracy theory, even though she had done so just an hour earlier in her testimony. And I think that's testament to the fact that both people are struggling to defend censorship when confronted publicly on it, and also that they are now starting to even deny their own claims that it had just been a some one of our conspiracy theories. Of course, I don't need to tell you and 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 many of your listeners, but there was no theorizing. We were discovering evidence of a conspiracy to secretly censor people, and we believe break the First Amendment of our Constitution, break the uh, not just any law, but arguably the most important law in the country. The most important law in the country, Tom Buick. Uh, do you? It seems to me that the whole problem is exposed, at least now. Uh, whether there are grounds for optimism, whether we can dismantle it. It would be right to say, wouldn't it, that we can see that the censorship that was dismissed as conspiracy theory was absolutely the case. Absolutely. And I think most of the population know that we live in a mass uh, surveillance uh, society, and I think they take some time steps to ensure, whether it's writing via email or you know whatever they do, they they look to try and sort of protect their privacy. But I think what Michael's talking about there in terms of, because we don't have a First Amendment uh, right uh, here in the United Kingdom, um, but neither, it seems to me, do we have as yet the mechanism actually to democratise freedom of speech and ensure that there are limits actually to the powers that the state can take to surveil us. It seems to me that all the legislation goes one way. It's always through emergency type legislation, taking further and further liberties away from us. And, you know, I was looking at the democracy report, uh, the latest one, Neil, just earlier. Ten years ago, the, the world's population, less than half the world's population, were living in authoritarian states. That's now gone up to 70 percent. So you know, more and more of the world's population are being led by autocrats and tyrannical leaders. And I wonder to what extent we in the West are fueling that yes. surge because of the activities of our own governments. Michael, uh, while I still have you, my, my central concern in many respects is do you think enough people care? Do enough of us properly pay attention to the absolute essential nature of the freedom to speak? Well, I think the answer is that we haven't been paying attention to the importance of that. I was asleep to the threat. I think many of us were. I think many of us were the, asleep to the threat of tyranny and that COVID really woke us up to that threat. I was also alive to that threat around my work on climate change, uh, which has also been used for advancing uh, creeping authoritarianism and even totalitarianism. I think you've done such important work of communicating this threat to people and explaining it to them. And I think the answer is that things have been changing and people are, when they, st I think this is the key. When you stop to think about your fundamental freedoms, most people don't want to give them up. Uh, we take it for granted that we have the right, not just to say what we believe, but also to hear what other people believe. Because of course, freedom of expression is actually goes two ways. I, it's not just that I want to speak my views, I want that, but I also want to hear your views. And I think we uh, need to come back to basics to some extent to reaffirm these freedoms. I will say I was in Washington. I met with a number of members of Congress. I met with a senator. The question of how to prevent government bureaucrats from behaving like totalitarians and attempting to censor us is very much alive in Congress. There is legislation that would prevent government officials from demanding censorship from social media platforms. We hope for a win in the Supreme Court next year, but we shouldn't rely on that. And I also will just add, we need a grassroots movement for this. This is why we do believe, and it's why I wanted to speak with you. We think that our relationship between the United States and Britain is particularly important in affirming a common movement for free speech. And it's why some of our best allies are in Britain. It's why we published a free speech manifesto called the Westminster Declaration, because we met in Westminster uh, area of London. And it was an internationally signed document, including signed by uh, John Cleese and Sophie Carlo and Ben Dilo and other uh, Winston Marshall and, and, and other people that were important British leaders for free speech. And, and we have Americans as well. Michael, we think our Michael, movement's just, growing, but we have to keep, keep the I'm fight. 
just running short on time, Michael, but I, I, honestly, it's so reassuring to listen to you. And I, 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 actually, against my expectations, you have lifted my spirits. You have actually been able to say the things that give me cause for, give me cause for optimism. So thank you so much, Michael Schellenberger. Yeah.